Okay, so um, this afternoon I will be leaving you an audio annotation with this PowerPoint presentation because I have noticed that the weather is not doing fine and it's not the internet is going to be affected with this one so might as well leave with this so that you can access anytime uh, the lesson without being uh, disturbed with the internet connectivity okay so this afternoon we're going to discuss the first one is on sampling and the central limit theorem and the second lesson that we are going to have is on the estimation of uh, parameters. Okay, so you might be asking, why do we need to sample when we are going to do research? Why not everybody is going to be included? For sure, there are reasons why we do sample. Playing. okay why sample only because the first one it is impossible to check everybody in the population the cost of studying everybody in the population is so much and it's time consuming to contact everybody in the population and aside from some natures of, of test are destructive so uh, during the trial phase of the coronavirus uh, vaccines, would you think everybody would want to participate in the in the trial? No, nobody would want that. Not not even now when these uh, vaccines are already proven and tested until phase three. Not everybody would want to be vaccinated with that different uh, vaccines, even if it is a Pfizer vaccine. Also. Uh, observing the sample is would give us adequate results rather than uh, the population so there are types of sampling that we are going to uh, discuss this afternoon the very common probability sampling methods okay so we have that simple random sampling the SRS uh, since it is a probability sampling method, everybody has a chance of being included. So, an example for that is the lottery sampling. Or that one that we are going to participate in the raffle draws on the um, department stores. So, that's an example of a si simple random sampling. Systematic random sampling is the same as a simple random sampling, only that you are very specific with the interval. So every case member of the population is selected for the sample. So every tenth, every fifth, every sixth. So just like the, the previous uh, 2020 customer satisfaction survey that I had with the uh, Magtan Cebu International Airport Authority and their stakeholders, the airline companies and the concessionaires. So I have to use the uh, simple random sampling and the systematic random sampling combined. But actually, it's a more of a cluster uh, sampling rather than SR on this one. Okay, so there is also what we call stratified random sampling. So dividing the population into groups, some groups called the strata. Okay, or each of them is uh, the stratum. Okay, so it is the same as the next one, which is the cluster sampling, only that in the cluster sampling, it is a bigger one. So they are similar, almost similar. So... In the stratified random sampling, for example, we are going to look into the population as the university uh, enrollees. Okay, so we divide them into colleges. So we have College of Arts and Sciences, College of Business, College of Education, College of Computer Studies, and so on. So there is engineering and architecture, so that is the subgroups, the colleges. And then each colleges. Uh, this is where we are going to look for the uh, sample. Okay, so suppose we are going to choose um, the College of Engineering and Architecture or the College of Criminal Justice Education. So 
uh, they become the sample. So everybody in there, the students that belong to their college should become the sample. Unlike in the cluster sampling that first you divide into primary units, then primary units uh, divided again or made. So, like, for example, in the Cebu City, if you're going to sample the Cebu City population, so first we will divide the Cebu City population into barangays, and there are 80 plus barangays, and each of the barangays is divided into cities. So, um, if we are going to choose a city, then that becomes everybody in the city is on the sample. There is also a term are related to this one we call it the proportionate allocation so when we say proportionate allocation we will uh, get the number of samples in accordance to the number of population or the population size so if for example in in the case of the university if college of business has the most number of enrollees so College of Business also has the most number of samples. And since the College of uh, Computer Studies has the least number of enrollees, so they will be represented only by a very few uh, samples. So that means it is a proportionate allocation. It is in proportion to the number of population in the group. But when we do sample, when we observe sample, there is always an inherent error. That is a sampling error. That is the difference uh, between what you observe in the sample and what is the true population parameter. And sometimes the sampling error is an overestimate. Sometimes it is an underestimate. But it is never exactly the same as a population parameter. And if we are going to collect all the sample, possible sample size that we select from the population, we call that presentation as the sampling distribution of the sample mean. So for example, we have this law firm. It has five associates, Dawn, Hardy, Kirst, Mallory, and Tillman. And each of them has this number of hours worth, and they build clients for their services if you would like to get partners two partners that you select randomly how many different samples are possible so you have you may partner Don Hardy so this is one two one three one four one five so Don Hardy Don Kears Don Mallory Don Tillman then Hardy Kears Hardy Mallory Hardy Tillman, Kears Mallory, Kears Tillman, and Mar Mallory Tillman. So you have the table. So approximately you have 10 different samples. And if you add the number of hours they build clients, you have this one. The total. And if you get the mean, since there are two, so if the total is 48, the mean is 24. If the total is 52, so you divide by 2, so the average is 26. Also, oh, this one, the average, you get the average on all of this after you total the number of hours they build, they build your clients. So this is the mean, the average of the total number of hours they build your clients. So if we are going to look at it in a frequency distribution table, so notice that the lowest here is 22 as the mean, sample mean. We have 24, 26, 28. So if we are going to put it on another table, so your sample mean is 22, 24, 26, 28. And there is only one averaging 22, 4 having the average of 24, 3 having the average of 26, and 2 having the average of 28. So the relative a frequency probability so it's 1 out of 10 and if you notice this is equal to 10 over 10 this is 5 and 5 10 over 10 or that is 1 so the sum of the sampling distribution of this discrete probability distribution is always equal to 1
Now, if you're looking at the computed mean of the sample means and compare it with the population, okay, so if you compute, there is 122, 224, 326, and 228, and divided by 10, that is equal to 25.2, okay? And if you also look at the, if you add all of those population means, you will get the same, that is 25.2. So notice that the mean of the sample means is equal to the population mean. If you add all the sample means, the sampling distribution of the means, it is equal to the population mean. And that is supported by what you call the central limit theorem. Okay, the central limit theorem specifies a theoretical distribution of that sampling distribution of the mean as an example. And it is formulated by the selection of all possible random samples of a fixed size n. And it is the sample mean is calculated for each sample mean and the distribution of sample means is considered. And the sampling distribution of the mean in a central limit theorem states that the mean of the sample means is equal to the mean of the population from which the samples are drawn. And the variance of the distribution, which is denoted by sigma, is divided by the square root of n. And that Sigma over the or variance over the square root of n Okay, is what you call the standard error of the mean or it is the standard deviation of over the square root of n Okay, so but then How large is large so you might be thinking how large is large? So, this is always the question of those uh, researchers and observers or critics of research. Because when you say how large is large, if the sample is normally distributed, so you have to check for normality on this one, then the, simply, the sampling distribution of your mean x bar will also be normal no matter what the sample size is. You have to remember that if they are going to ask you why your sample size is small and you would say my sample is taken from a normally distributed population therefore any sample size that I will get is also normally distributed then when the sample population is approximately symmetric the distribution becomes approximately normal for relatively small values of your n symmetric meaning to say is still normal because when you say symmetric the uh, the when you're going to divide it into two the other part looks exactly the same as the other and that is the characteristic of the normal distribution the bell-shaped curve and when the sample population is skewed meaning to say it's no longer normal then the sample size must be, must be at least 30 before the sampling distribution of your mean becomes approximately normal. So this uh, justifies the rule of thumb which is equal to 30. That is when the sample population is skewed, you must need at least 30 for it to become uh, normal. Okay, and to determine the probability that a sample mean falls within a particular region, we will use this formula. That is, we are going to convert them into standard normal z-score. That is, the value of your mean in the sample minus the mean of the population over the standard error of the mean. In which that is standard deviation over the square root of N. And we will use uh, sigma in place of S if the population standard deviation is known. But these are just uh, 
they mean the same thing. It's, it's standard deviation, but uh, only the notation matters. This is for the population, the sigma, and the S is for the standard deviation for the sample. Okay, so let us have an example. Suppose the mean selling price of a gallon of gasoline in the United States is $1.30. Further, the, uh, it is assumed that the distribution is positively skewed. So it's not normal, it is skewed. With the standard deviation of 0 0.28 or 28 cents, what is the probability of selecting a sample of 35 gasoline stations and finding the sample mean within 8 cents? Okay, so the first step is you're going to convert uh, the Z. Remember that our gasoline price is 130 it is you are going you are asked here to find the sample mean within eight cents so meaning to say within eight cents so 130 minus 0 0.08 130 plus 0 0.08 that's within if you have this one you need to find the corresponding Z for the 122. Remember, it's 130 minus 0.08 is 122 and 1.38. So there, these are the two points within 0 0.08 of the population mean. So first, follow the formula. So X bar minus the mu over the standard error of the uh, mean. So it's 138. And how many more on the you do first the bigger one? So it's 138 minus, remember the, the, the population mean is 130. Standard deviation is 28. And remember that it is 35 gasoline stations. So that is your number of cases. That's your N. So square root of 35 and if you do that in the calculator the result is 1.69 remember we will look at this 1.69 in the table of areas under the normal curve okay so next is the 1.22 Okay, so the same formula, 1.22 minus 130 over uh, 0.28 over the square root of 35, so it's negative 1.69. So again, you look at this one, then positive 1.69 and the negative 1.69 in the uh, standard normal distribution table. Okay, so I have here first the negative table. So if you look at this, negative 1.6 on the left side, 1.6, and you look at 0 0.09. So here the intersection is 0 0.04551. Remember that. That's for negative 1.69. And then for positive 1.69 is 1.6 under column 0 0.09, so 0.9545. So that means 0.9545 minus 0 0.04551 or approximately that's 0 0.909. So why do we subtract the 2? Because it is said in between. Okay, so for, you have to remember that if it is in between, you have to subtract the values that you see on the table. You have to take note that there is no negative answer because it is a probability. There is no such thing as negative probability. And if uh, the question is asking for less than, so, kanila, this one only, only the, the, the value that you see on the table. But if it is 
greater than or more than, remember, greater than or more than, that is 1 minus the value that you see on the table. Okay, so going back to this, uh, convert this into percent so we would expect about 91 percent of the sample means to be within 0.08 of the or 8 cents of the population mean okay so you have these two activities again you have to remember that if the problem is asking for between it is you subtract the two values that you see on the table and if it is less than that is real the value that you see on the table is the answer and if it is uh, more than or greater than or above then you're going to use one minus the table the value that you see on the table Okay, now let's move on to estimation of population parameters. So we have two estimates, the point estimate and the interval, interval estimate. So when we say point estimate, it is just single value. Single statistic, like the mean or the proportion. And if it is an interval estimate, there is a range of values. And when we say confidence interval, that is the range of values within which the population parameter is expected to occur. And the most common is the 95% and the 99%. And what is the default in the uh, statistical software is the 95%. Okay, there are factors that determine the width of the confidence interval. That is the sample size the desired level of confidence and the variability in the population denoted by estimated by the standard deviation s so when we say for a 95 percent confidence interval that is about 95 percent of the similarly constructed intervals will contain the parameter being estimated and also you can say that uh 95% of the sample means for a specified sample size will lie within 1.96 standard deviations of the hypothesized population mean. And for the 99% confidence interval, you could say that 99% of the sample means for a specified sample size will lie within 2.58 standard deviations of the hypothesized sample mean. So you have to remember that the Value that will correspond to your 95% is 1.96 and the value that will correspond, the Z value that will correspond to your 99% is 2.58. For the 90%, it's not included here, for the 90% is 1.645. Okay, standard error of the sample mean, so that is, it's already discussed last time, so that is this one over the square root of n, the standard, the standard deviation over the square root of n. Okay, so we'll just go through this one, standard error, okay. So if s is not known and the sample size is greater than 30, the standard deviation of the sample designated by s is used to approximate the population standard deviation. That is if your n is greater than or equal to 30. And you will have that formula. Okay, so if the population standard deviation is known for the sample uh, or the sample is greater than 30, we use this. Okay, so confidence interval of the mean is the point estimate plus minus the standard, the margin of error. You call this one now the margin of error. Okay, so for the 95% confidence interval for the population mean, so x bar plus minus 1.96 times the standard error. And this portion here is, uh, as what I have mentioned, this is what you call the margin of error. So if you construct confidence intervals, it is the point estimate plus minus the margin of error. So that you will have the lower bound and the upper bound. 
And if you will have the 99% confidence interval, that's the point estimate plus minus 2.58 times the standard error. Okay, so example here. The dean of the uh, school of business wants to estimate the mean number of hours worked per week by students. So a sample of 49 students showed a mean of 24 hours within a stand with a standard deviation of 4 hours. So what is the population mean? Okay, the population mean is not known. So our best estimate for this value is the sample, which is 24 hours. And that is called the point estimates. If you're going to construct your 95% CI, okay, using the formula, so that's 24 plus minus 1.26 times 4 over the square root of 49 or 4 over 7. So approximately you have 24 plus minus 1.12. So the confidence li limits range from 22.88 to 25. Point. So, when about 95% of the similarly constructed intervals include the population parameter. Okay, so if the population SD is unknown, the underlying population is approximately normal and the sample size is less than 30, then we use the T distribution. Okay, use the same formula but only you will get it from the uh, table of T. Okay, so the value of T for a given confidence level depends upon the degrees of freedom. Okay, so you have this one, characteristics of the T distribution, continuous also, bell shaped and symmetrical. And you have to remember there is a family of T distributions. And it is more spread out and flatter at the center than the normal distribution. And the differences that diminish as N. That difference in the uh, flutter, the flatness at the center would diminish as you increase your sample size. And the assumption is that the population is, is normal or nearly normal. Okay, now we have to go to the confidence interval for the population proportion. So that is P, that means proportion, plus minus Z times the square root of P times its complement P minus a uh, 1 minus P, or that is Q over N. So you have a sample of 500 executives who own their homes, and it is revealed that 175 of them plan to sell their homes and retire to Arizona. So you will ask to develop a 98% confidence interval. This time is 98. So 98, if you look at it in the internet, it is equal to 2.33. So all of these mga confidence intervals and the values of the Z, if you, if the 95, if you forget, you can always find it in the internet. And sometimes in the internet, you can also do calculations. So if you hate the formula that I presented here, you may use the online scientific calculator and that is okay. I mean, it's not that you need to do it manually because what is important here is you understand what you are doing because in the online calculator, you need to understand also what values you need to uh, encode. Okay, so here you have, you are not given the proportion, but you know that it's 175 over 500. That is the proportion. So if you divide that, that is approximately that's 35%. So if we are going to plug it in the formula, the 175 over 500, that's 0.35 plus minus the value that corresponds to 98% CI is 2.33 and square root of uh, 0.35 times 0.65. Take note that if you add P and Q, that is equal to 1 over the 500, which is the sample size. That is... 0.35 plus minus 0.0497 and you may you may uh, leave it like that or you may have it uh, 0.35 minus 0.0497 and you will have come up 0.35 plus 0.0497 
Then we have this finite population, okay? So, in which it has a fixed upper bound. Okay, so although this is not uh, discussed on books, but we need to discuss this finite population correction factor. So, here we need to adjust the standard errors of, of the sample means and the proportion. And it has this one. Okay, and the standard error of the sample proportions is this one. Okay. And ignore finite population correction factor if when you find the ratio of the sample over the population, the result would be less than 0 0.05. Okay, so here, 95% confidence interval of the mean number of hours work per week, if you remember that study. Okay, so if you look at it, if we need to have the finite population correction factor, if there is no need because your small n over big N is 49 over 500, that's 0 0.098, and that is greater than 0 0.05. Okay, so... But then if we are going to use the finite population correction factor, I'm sorry because, uh, yeah, I, I, I got mixed up. It's... Uh, 0 0.098 we will not use the i the, the sorry the population finite population correction factor if it is less than and if it is in this case it is more than so we need to use sorry sorry for that okay so we need to use the finite population correction factor so that means we have this one 24 plus minus 1.96 times 4 over the square root of 49 times 500 minus 49 over 500 minus 1. So, approximately this is the answer. So, 24 minus 1.0648 or 24 plus 1.0648. Three factors that determine the size of the sample. It's the confidence that you desire the level of confidence the margin of error that you will tolerate and the variability of the population being studied and in relation to that is the calculation of the sample size okay this is the formula of calculating the sample size so for example a consumer group would like to estimate the mean monthly uh, electricity charge for a single family house in July within uh, $5 using 99% of confidence uh, level of confidence. So based on similar studies, the standard deviation is estimated to be 20. So how large the sample is for this study. So using the formula, that's Corresponding to 99% confidence level is 2.58 times uh, 20 is the standard deviation over the uh, your allowable error is 5, so over 5. So, and then you square this one, so you need to have 107 uh, sample size. Again, computing sample size here using the formula is also uh, done in online calculators. So there are a lot of calculators that you choose on it. So what I'm discussing here are the basic sample size computation. So there are a lot of things that you will consider when you're going to compute sample size. And if it is good for us because it's we, we, there are no randomized controlled trials but for the medical uh, field uh, sample size computation is very strict if it is an rcr that also depends on the design of the study so if your study is diagnostic in nature so there is a way of computing sample size and we will be using the builders formula so there are a lot so once you learn the sample size computation you would notice that these are the basic but the uh, online calculators are also using the same concept as this one. There is Cochrane's formula for sample size computation and so on. 
a lot. And you will be amazed if you uh, use the online calculator. Wala na hago if you use the online calculator. This one also is for the proportion. Again, there is online calculator for this one. So, I don't think we need to discuss this one very, very thoroughly. So, here. Okay, so you can have this one. You can just browse this one. Okay, so here. Okay, and the following is going to be the... Uh, activities okay so I think that's all formula okay so it's still the some uh, the standard error and you have the n minus square root of n minus n over n minus 1 the capital n is the population size always remember that and the small n is the sample size so this is the formula for the finite population correction error. 